Welcome everyone to the SAB's November webinar, Building Automated Programs for Early Detection of Lung Cancer, sponsored by AstraZeneca. Before we get started, just a few items to go over for all of our attendees. You have joined in a listen-only mode. Please ask questions throughout the lecture by using the question feature. It's located on your control panel. We will address all the questions at the end of the webinar during our Q&A. Dr. Pritchett is the SAB's past president and he will be moderating tonight's session. At this time, I will hand it over to Dr. Pritchett. Thanks, Emily, and thanks everybody for joining tonight. Uh, we have a, a great sponsored webinar. This is sponsored by AstraZeneca. Um, and we have a fantastic panel here uh, that I'm going to introduce you to in a moment. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about building an automated program for early detection of lung cancer. Uh, you may be asking what's an automated program. Uh, it, hopefully by the end of tonight you're going to learn that. Um, and we really do want it to be somewhat automated. Things running in the background, things that are set up uh, to help you uh, detect nodules uh, and then figure out what you're going to do with all that downstream. So we'll go to the next slide and you can um, uh, see our panelists. Uh, again, I'm Michael Pritchett. I'm an advanced bronchoscopist and past president of the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. And I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Susan Garwood. Um, it's lovely to be with you all tonight. Um, I will be the incoming treasurer next year. So excited to be more on the executive board for SAB. Um, I function as an advanced bronchoscopist. I'm here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the pulmonary director for the um, the physician director for the pulmonary service line for HCA. It's about 184 hospitals, so that'll give you some some background on um, why we needed to do what we did. So excited to be here tonight. Hi everyone. I'm uh, Jeffrey Thompson. I'm also very excited to be here. I'm an advanced bronchoscopist and lung cancer specialist at the University of Pennsylvania. All right, well, thanks for the introductions. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that uh, these are our opinions. They don't represent AstraZeneca, although they are sponsoring this. Um, please don't screenshot, copy, reproduce, you know, you can't awesome. tape uh, or distribute this, um, but this will be recorded uh, and will be uh, available afterwards uh, if you or anybody else misses this. Uh, so again, very happy to be with uh, my colleagues uh, in advanced bronchoscopy. We're representing this to you tonight from three different perspectives, from a small community hospital to a large hospital system uh, to a major academic hospital as well. So we're going to try to represent all three of those perspectives as we go through tonight. Uh, so we'll start off with Dr. Thompson. He's going to give us a little bit of introduction and why this is a problem. Uh, then Dr. Garwood's going to literally steal the show and, and show you some of the data that she's uh, accumulated there at HCA. Um, and then I'll back clean up at the end and just kind of summarize everything. And then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Uh, please submit your questions anytime throughout. We're going to save them for the end, but there's a little questions box over on the right side in your control panel. Uh, submit questions at any time throughout this, uh, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Thompson. So thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Um, so, you know, this is a lot of summary slides that, that, that many of us are very familiar with, and that um, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related death. More than one in five of all cancer deaths are, are due to lung cancer. And although we are making progress, you know, still the, the five-year survival rate for lung cancer is still only 22%. And, you know, one of the major challenges is that, you know, still the vast majority of, of patients with new diagnosis of lung cancer are still diagnosed with advanced stage disease. And you can see in this, you know, bar chart here, you can see how the survival really falls off quite precipitously in those patients, you know, with advanced stage disease compared to if we diagnose patients earlier, they have a significantly improved overall survival compared to if they're diagnosed with later stage disease. And, you know, this is a, just a schematic about um, kind of the multidisciplinary and cancer care continuum of patients. And pulmonologists are really playing an increasing role in the cancer care continuum in our lung cancer patients. We're often, you know, the first touch point of patients into, you know, a healthcare system when there's a suspected, you know, new diagnosis of lung cancer. And, you know, we really, you know, guide those patients to ensure they receive, you know, appropriate uh, management and follow-up, timely biopsies, 
ensure that those patients um, you know, get sufficient bio- biopsies for appropriate biomarker testing, and then guide you know referrals to the various subspecialists. And I, I think we're increasingly you know playing you know a role in ensuring patients are you know adequately staged at diagnosis so they get treatment. I think we're really critical in ensuring they get on the right trajectory to ultimately receive uh, the right care for all of our patients. And you know with the broader use of of CT scans, it's estimated that in the United States we do probably about 4.8 million CT scans a year. And on those CT scans, you might detect about 1.6 million pulmonary nodules. And in in those pulmonary nodules, about 160,000 are indeterminate pulmonary nodules. And when you look through data, it it seems that a significant percentage of these indeterminate pulmonary nodules don't receive appropriate follow-up. And that really leads to missed opportunities to diagnose patients with early stage disease where they might um, be more treatable and have improved outcomes. And so it's really critical to have a systematic evaluation of these patients to ensure they receive, you know, guideline concordant care and appropriate and timely follow-up. And then just a little word on, on not, not only is it important to have lung nodule programs to ensure that incidental lung nodules, you know, receive appropriate follow-up, but also to have robust lung cancer screening programs and to ensure that the patients that you know, meet criteria for lung cancer screening, do indeed um, enroll in a lung cancer screening program and then receive uh, appropriate follow-up within that lung cancer screening program. And consistently, when we look at data, you know, the uptake of lung cancer screening still remains I- extremely poor. You know, if you see this this graph here from the CDC and the American Lung Association, the most recent rates are around 6% of patients who qualify for lung cancer screening ultimately uh, undergo a scan of the chest, which is significantly lower than colorectal breast and, and cervical cancer screening rates. And so, you know, we have a lot of work to do in, in implementing lung cancer screening within our patients and ensuring those patients get, you know, appropriate follow-up to really hopefully kind of shift our patients from being diagnosed with advanced stage disease to shifting that to more and more patients are diagnosed with earlier stage disease where the disease is more manageable. So with that, I'll let uh, Dr. Garwood uh, take the show. I'm excited to talk through this. I do think this is really a novel way for us to present this information with Dr. Thompson being in academics, myself being in a large IDN system, meaning a community hospital. We have 184 of those within HCA. So Really, the problem has been laid out. And at HCA, we decided that part of what we needed to do was figure out a solution for all the people that fell through the cracks. And he already showed you the volume of nodules that are being done throughout our health institutions. So about 1.6 million nodules are floating around there to the best of our knowledge. Um, So the question is, you know, what do we do? So low lung nodule follow-up. So he talked about those 160,000 maybe only about 30,000 of those, you know, really got the follow-up they need. So we know about only 30% get the follow-up. So we needed a solution. And this was when I came over to HCA um, in 2015. I spent a lot of time at an institution um, down the street, also a large community-based practice, where we had a really great stage three and stage four um, lung cancer program. So we did a lot of EBIS, which probably most of us did in the early, um, around 2010 to 2015. But what we kept seeing when we had tumor board was that we had imaging in our own institution, a chest X-ray, a CT scan, an abdominal scan, where patients that we diagnosed with advanced stage cancer fell through our cracks, okay? So they came into our home is what I call it, and they left our home with cancer without us telling them. And we decided we wanted to develop software. So we looked at a lot of other um, commercially available products and decided that we just didn't think we had the right fit. So we decided to build our own. Um, software platform to flag CT scans for lung nodules. That platform is called Patient ID. The whole issue with lung cancer, as Dr. Thompson showed, is if we can find lung cancer smaller than a centimeter, that five-year survival could be over 90%. So we decided that we really wanted the pulmonologist to take the lead. Um, We actually have some thoracic surgeons who take the lead on some of these um, nodule programs, but our lead is six millimeters or greater. Um, on a CT report. And we started in the emergency room. We felt that those were our highest risk patients, often lacked good connectivity to primary care, often had more comorbidities, often had less um, health um, 
you know, information. And so um, we started there and then we moved to our inpatient unit and then our outpatient unit. And we also wanted to check to see if the patient was eligible. So say the patient already had a known cancer diagnosis, that patient would not be eligible. We would forward them to their oncologist. Say they were already connected with a pulmonologist who was aware of the nodule or maybe not even aware. We would also refer them back to their primary pulmonologist. They may be a hospice patient or out of state or have an insurance barrier. So we navigated those that we consider to be eligible based on those criteria. Now, we had some um, strong software language in there. So as the nodule was calcified, we threw it out. If it was not pulmonary in nature, sometimes our CT scans will note thyroid nodules or kidney nodules. So it had negating factors to make sure we were highly specific in the information that we um, procured from our automated imaging. Now, we also felt like we needed to overread our screening CT scan. So we do know that an LRAD 3 or a 4, 3 being um, likely benign but can't be sure, um, and a 4 being suspicious, we wanted to make sure that our primary care physicians and others knew that they had a pathway with a lung nodule clinic and a screening clinic to get assistance. And so we actually um, moved those through our nodule pathway after our automated software. So after our software actually went into play, we realized we needed to hand these nodules to somebody who had the clinical acumen in order to search through the medical record and give us more information. So we actually hired navigators to manage the output from this patient navigation program. Now, this is different than a cancer navigator, which some of you may have. And this is really what we want you to take away. So that the types of individuals we hired to be our nodule coordinator really were able to care for patients throughout the whole care continuum. They would assist patients, clinicians, stakeholders in collection, uh, reporting, and the presentation of the program outcome. Um, so our qualifications, you could be um, an, an RN. Um, you could be a radiology register. You could have my current nodule coordinator worked in radiation oncology. So really two or more years of clinical healthcare related experience. And we obviously would prefer somebody with radiology, pulmonary or oncology experience. And that's what most of ours are throughout the HCA system. And if you think about the number of nodules that they're seeing right now, our productivity per nodule coordinator is 1200 nodules managed yearly. And that includes workup and navigation. So this looks like a complicated slide, but again, we want to um, understand the care pathway. So the first thing is that once the um, patient is documented as having a nodule, we first want to interact with their primary care physician. So we don't want to overstep our bounds here. So the first is to check with the primary care physician. If they don't have a primary care physician, then we contact the patient directly. Once we get permission, quote unquote, to navigate the patient, like Dr. Thompson said, we want to make sure that the pulmonologist has a seamless plan at the time of that clinic visit. So we want to make sure that we're prepared to take action. And if you're prepared to take action on a nodule, you have to think about risk stratification. Would that look like a blood test to help you risk stratify? Would it look like a PET scan to help you risk stratify? You may need dedicated imaging of the chest if it was only an abdominal film. I think if you're thinking about going to bronchoscopy, then I want to know what their lung function is so that I can think about, even before a diagnosis is made, if that patient could be a surgical candidate or if they may be a candidate for SBRT. So within HCA, so at the time of the clinic visit, I'm able to make a clinical assessment of risk. I'm able to schedule them on the same day for tissue sampling, whether that be EBIS or a navigational bronchoscopy, whether um, that be a um, peripheral navigation or robotic. And sometimes it means that I call in my surgeon partner, um, like I did today, um, as we had a small, very peripheral subpleural nodule with negative nodes. So I'm going to EBIS the patient, and then the surgeon will do a wedge biopsy um, if needed. So we want to have an all in one clinic visit. Much like Dr. Thompson said, I want to be thinking already about the amount of tissue that I'm obtaining to make sure I get enough for molecular testing. Even in the early stage, um, again, that's very important. Now, let's say that patient came back negative for cancer. So if they had a definitive negative diagnosis like sarcoid or histo, we would close that patient out and hand them on to the appropriate treating physician. Or if they were non-diagnostic, we needed a clear delineation of what that follow-up was going to be. Often that may be culture follow-up at the six-week mark or a repeat CT scan at three or six weeks, three or six months. 
all of those things have a human attached to them that is not myself. So thank God I have some helpers. So what does this look like? And I think this is the most important thing. Um, I, I think one of the statistics we often hear in our current environment, 95% of our cancers are found in the incidental space, 95%. So if you don't have an automated program helping you come through your electronic medical record and your imaging, you need one because only 5% of our cancers are being found in CT lung screening. Now we're gonna talk about that in the future. But if you're talking about the value proposition to adding automation to this process, this is what it looks like. So within HCA, like I said, we have 184 hospitals. In order to get the nodule program, we had to make sure that you had the appropriate receivers, meaning that you had an advanced bronchoscopist or an IP physician who could do the biopsy or a thoracic surgeon who would take that role. You needed to have access to radiation oncology, medical oncology, and um, a surgical program. You had to have an um, MDM program, um, so multidisciplinary management conference had to be in place, and you had to have both a coordinator and a nurse navigator. So we turned these things on slowly from 2017 um, to 19. So we did some testing over that timeframe to make sure that the plan would work well. And then beginning in uh, 2019 uh, to 2021, we began rolling out these programs So this is what 100 facilities looks like within HCA. So our total CT scans, 1.4 million. Okay, so that had um, a field of view of the lung. So that could be an extremity CT scan. That could be a head and neck CT scan. That could be any imaging of the chest. It could be any imaging of the abdomen that including those lower fields. So lots of scan opportunities. And there are some programs, um, automated programs that only include the chest themselves. We wanted to look everywhere. Everywhere there was opportunity to see the lung And if it was greater than six millimeters, then we wanted to look at it. So of those 1.4 million, 20,000 of them had a nodule that was greater than six millimeters that were eligible for the program. We talked about eligibility earlier. So percentage of eligible patients who were navigated, meaning that they accepted navigation, 63%. Now, I would love for that to be 100%, but some people live out of state. Some people just declined. um, And we use those declining primary care or patients as education opportunities. So the percentage of navigated patients who have procedures, this is where your ears should peak up because we are not trying to drive all these patients to procedures. We're trying to drive the appropriate patient to procedures with risk stratification, with guardrails in place on what good patient management looks like. So with those things in mind, we had 25% of the patients with incidental nodules that were eligible for navigation had a procedure. And of those, we had 1,400 cancers. So that's about 9 to 12 percent, depending on what part of the country you were in. Um, Here in Nashville, uh, we were at 11 percent of our incidental patients had cancer. Um, If you look at what Thompson presented earlier, I think part of that came from Gould study. It said about a 4 percent malignancy rate for incidental pulmonary nodules. So I think you got to do a lot of legwork on screening to find lung cancer, which is fine, because when you find lung cancer on screening, 70% of the time or greater, it's going to be early stage disease. So screening is very important, but look at our numbers. And we did a pathetic job, just like everybody else in the country is doing. Screening has a lot of obstacles, I think. So of our screening population, we screened um, within HCA walls. We do have some joint ventures that aren't on here, um, just 12,000 people. And we found 62 cancers. Now, if you look at 62 compared to 1,400, guess what the split is? 95.5. So I think if you want to know where your proposition is to find lung cancer currently in this present state, it is in this incidental space. So this is actually what it looks like here in the Nashville market. So again, I was part of the the beta site. So I was um, the second um, second facility rolled out. Um, We also did an awful job with screening. So we screened just over 1,500 patients. Now we're about 2,500 this year. So we are increasing some of that um, guideline changes, but found only five cancers with lung cancer screening. We found 110 again um, with our uh, nodule management program, about 90,000 CT scans that had a field of view of the lung um, and actually got my percentage wrong. It looks like 13% of our incidentals uh, that were navigated had cancer. So if you look at the value proposition at 2% or 3% with um, screening, versus 13%, certainly worthwhile. I think if you're not doing this to figure out a way.
So this actually looks like what our performance looks like over time. This is by month. And you can see, again, 2020 is uh, in the bottom, 2021 in the middle, 2022. And again, those are the number of eligible patients. You can imagine um, the more patients we get into the system, COVID really was a big actually increase for us because of all the chest imaging and all the follow-up. But these are the number of patients who are navigated per month. Um, and if you look at those uh, numbers, the numbers are quite high. So 154, it looks like that we did um, um, in June. But um, I review these every Monday and um, I review them personally with our navigator um, and we're usually reviewing anywhere from 25 to 40 um, every week. And so it is um, a labor of love on us, um, but very effective for us to actually move the patients through the system and to reassure the physicians that we have responsible handling of them, that we're only using our fancy robot or other diagnostics whenever it is essential. And because of that, we're able to find lung cancer so our program statistics, so on average across HCA, about two and a half percent of our CT scans have a nodule. Greater than 90 percent of them have to have additional imaging. We haven't even spoken about that. So if you want to talk about downstream revenue, no matter what, they need an, a, an interval follow-up the majority of the time. Sometimes I look at them and it's clear that it's been stable. Um, the radiologist may have missed prior imaging or the imaging may actually show that it's calcified. Um, or that it's decreased in size. And so not every single person requires follow-up imaging, but 90% of the time they will do. So I think on average, 20% of our patients require a procedure. Anywhere from 9 to 16% of them have a positive cancer diagnosis. And the most important factor that they care about is that we have a 20 to 25% conversion to thoracic surgery. We would love for those numbers to continue to increase. Remember, these could be symptomatic patients or Again, we call this incidental. Sometimes they're found with urosepsis and they have an abdominal image with a CT. But these are a mixture of inpatient, ER patients, and outpatients. And so the stage is going to vary. But again, that surgical conversion um, at 25% is going to catch your administrator's um, uh, catch their administrator's eye. And for those of you, again, this is the SAB. So what does it look like when you really begin to comb your EMR and comb your synapse? So what does it mean if you look for small peripheral nodules? When I began this program, we were in the throes of trying to find incidental nodules through this program. And you can see about 18% of the time um, in 2019, I was doing robotics for peripheral navigation. In 2020, that increased to 37%. In 2021, about 70% of the time, what I'm doing in the Bronx suite um, involves robotic bronchoscopy because I'm searching for small peripheral nodules, which means ideally, if that's where I'm starting, then we have a higher percentage of early stage disease. So it really has changed what I'm doing and very much driven our volume. We're just over a thousand um, robotic bronchoscopies since 2019. Yeah, we'll do. We'll open this up for some discussion uh, amongst the three of us. As as you mentioned before, we're in three different uh, settings here, whether it's academic, a small community, uh, or a big IDN network. Um, so I think a lot of people are asking specifically, what kind of software do you need to detect nodules, um, either in radiology reports or through the actual scans themselves? You mentioned that the existing platforms that were out there weren't cutting it for you, so you had to do it yourself. Is that something that's practical? Is that very common? Uh, and, and what did you look at before you got to that conclusion? That's a great question. What makes the best fit? And also, who is going to pay for it? So I think our biggest issue was it was a big capital outlay um, for some of the commercial products that we didn't know if it was going to fit our individual needs. We also wanted to be able to change the levers. Um, and if we were willing to modify the software, a lot of the time, um, it may cost additional money to do that. We started, and you can you can start very simply. You can start with your radiology IT and ask them to flag words like Fleischner or nodule um, in order to get started. Again, you still have to have the human to hand that to uh, to work that. But the software really depends on who's going to pay for it. How do you get? We didn't have any value proposition at that point, Mike. Yeah, and Jeff, what are you guys doing at a large academic medical center with respect to nodule detection? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like right now we do have the, you know, capability to, um, you know, extract in an automated fashion, you know, the pulmonary nodule detection. Again, it's kind of a, a homegrown, uh, you know, detection software. But the vast majority of our, you know, lung nodule program is really based on, you know, referrals, either self-referrals from patients 
or um, or from primary care physicians. Um, and so we're we're still kind of working out the logistics associated with the downstream implications of detecting and and managing these patients. So I was going to ask Susan, you know, like when you rolled this out, you're talking about reviewing over a million scans. You know, like how how did you, you know, adjust the um, you know, the, the flow of patients to where you could handle that downstream volume initially. I think we realized that there was a lot of discrepancy in the way that the radiologists read the reports. So we had a lot of noise in the beginning. So we're able to fine tune, um, you know, those 1.4 million scans, you know, down to 20,000 scans for all 100 institutions. So you start dividing those up into the ones that were actionable. We were able to really fine tune so what I would say is start small. So we started with an alpha sign, one hospital only. Then we grew that to a few others within that facility. Then we moved to another facility before we began to expand. The problem is going to be the false positives. And do you have a human, right? Because if AI works the way that it should, then everything will just be true positive. We know that's not real life. So what we had to do was spend our time really um, changing the levers to make sure we had it as specific as possible to take out the noise. So we just work with our data scientists to review these and make sure that we were able to handle the volume. And to handle the volume, I don't just hand this to any program. If you're going to have it, then you have to have the coordinator. You have to have the physician champion. You have to have dedicated clinic time. You have to have dedicated bronchoscopy time. You have to have dedicated presence at multidisciplinary clinic. So this is not for the faint of heart, but if this is your life's work, like it is mine, then yes, I want to do all those things. But I think you have to be able to know that there are multiple, multiple things that go into this, not just a software. And for those people who are wondering, you know, not not every site will be able to, you know, build this themselves. So I guess you have to ask yourself, you know, do you buy it or do you build it? And and that answer may be different based on your institution. Your IT may not have the bandwidth, pun intended, uh, to do this themselves. Um, so you may need to look at software. And there are plenty of software packages out there. I was going to just, you know, say that, that one of the bullet points on here that I'm sure everyone's thinking to themselves is, how do you get the navigators to be funded? You know, how do you go to the administration and say, you know, initially when you were you know building this program, how did you make the argument to say, oh, yes, we definitely need navigators to do this? Yeah, and I think that's, again, they wouldn't give us, you know, one to begin with. And so what we did was we borrowed, right? So we borrowed half of an FTE. We borrowed, you know, one quarter of an FTE uh, to do a um, to do an alpha site. You know, so we did, you can run these in the background. So before we turn programs on, we actually can run the software in the background and go, okay, how are we going to be able to manage this? Do we have part of an FTE that we can borrow? Um, but basically we we started with an alpha. We looked at the downstream revenue from that and realized the downstream revenue will cover itself. But you need talks like this, which will help. If I had one of these, it would have helped me. Um, same thing when I got robotic navigation. What I did was use my own paper from Super Dimension. The very first year I had, you know, I had 100 bronchoscopies my first year that were new to the system. You know, early stage disease was very high, 50 plus percent at early stage disease. And so use that same argument when I applied that to robotic bronchoscopy to say that the downstream is worth it. Yeah, I think sometimes we have difficulty convincing administration to do something. You know, it, it's like this, if you build it, they will come kind of thing and they want it. Well, you've got to have them already coming before we'll fund this. And so I think so. you really need to have an administration that's open minded and willing to work with you and, and, and trust your assurances, which I'm sure they get from every specialty that wants something. Right. They all give assurances. Uh, just get us this and it'll be the best urology program ever. Uh, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it, it takes some of that trust on their part. Uh, because what we don't want to get into is exactly what you mentioned. They fund the software, you flip the switch, and now you have way too much work and nobody to do it. Um, and, and so you're exactly right about there's so many different facets that you need. And it goes all the way down to even OR block time or anesthesia time or, you know, because somebody has to biopsy all these things. Um, and so I, that's basically the last point. How many pulmonologists or surgeons do you need to do these procedures? Um, Obviously, it depends on on your your program and, and how much time you have dedicated to do that. Because if you're reviewing, you know, 40 scans every Monday or 100 scans every Monday, 
well, then you're probably not doing a lot of procedures then. So then they have to fund another partner to come in or maybe another robot for another site. Uh, mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is built on downstream revenue. How have you gotten them to care about downstream revenue? So get them in their gut, um, get them in their heart, and then talk about what it means and how you have a solution. If you go in with a plan and you go in with a solution, you go in downstream at the end, you know, you'll get them. OK, because they really can't argue with that downstream. But what you want to talk about is early stage diagnosis and increasing the funnel and volume of patients that you get earlier in the system. Yeah. And and how is your help overall to, to both of you um, it, with your navigators calling PCPs about nodules uh, on a scan that they may have ordered? How is that viewed by your PCPs? Is it welcome help? Is it meddling? Um, what are you running into? <laughs> I think there will be some. Few. And I would say at this point, probably 2% of our physicians who really opt out. The rest of the time, our software actually picks the physicians and will show me an opt out list. And then we just go and we say, let me let me just talk you through this. Let me give you some examples. You know, let me share some stories with you. You know, give me one chance. Um, and so now we're at 98% acceptance. Um, and that, that's pretty great. Yeah, I, I would say that's really interesting. You know, I, I would say our primary care physicians seem you know more than willing to kind of relinquish care of the pulmonary nodules and i would say the patients once they're in a lung nodule program really appreciate it as well and i would say a picture's worth a thousand words you know the the patients love looking at their scans seeing the nodules going over appropriate lung nodule management and i think there's a lot of reassurance you know at the at the patient level because i have a lot of patients coming in to clinic, they're so anxious, you know, and they have a four millimeter nodule or, or, or something like that. And you can allay a lot of that anxiety, kind of explain, you know, you know, the, their risk of lung cancer, show them the nodule, discuss, you know, optimal, you know, surveillance uh, plan. And I think that they really appreciate that. And then that gets fed back to the primary care physicians. And, and I think they've been very happy you know, to kind of refer patients into a lung nodule program. All right. I think the other thing is just reassuring them for responsible handling. And so I think that the confidence in communicating your decision making is important and the communication of when they have a cancer that the primary care physician will be involved. What oncologist would you like them to see? Let me tell you what they showed. At, what? Let me tell you about our discussion at MDT. Do you have a surgical preference? Um, so all of those things, as long as they felt like you're re re handling them responsibly, responsibly, communicating with them and making them feel like they're part of the plan, um, then I think that's that's it. Well, I think there are two problems. Like you said, I, I told you, um, you know, incidental, I think we've really fine tuned this, but I think we have to think beyond that now. So if we're going to find early stage cancer and we're going to increase lung cancer screening, could we automate that as well? So we're trying to creatively think outside the box. And like we said, we know that the screening rates currently sit around 6%. We're hoping Medicare has realized that lung cancer happens earlier and with lower pack years, uh, specifically in African-Americans, our brown and black population, um, and um, in women. And so they have changed the guidelines to age 50 to 80. Um, and now it's only 20 pack years instead of 30. So still the same guideline to currently smoke or quit within the past 15 years. So we want to make sure that we're disseminating this information to our primary care physicians. We did a big banner presentation. We did CME. We let them know that the Family Practice Association now agreed um, that the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommendation, all of these things were recommended for screening this population we still got very little of an uptick. So we thought, again, automation helped us once. Could it help us in screening as well? So barriers to lung cancer screening, they may exist at multiple levels, and we all know this. And so I think automation is where this comes into play. So patient barriers, so competing needs and demands for healthcare. Cost, fear. I think fear is one of the, the biggest ones. When we launched our automated program and we started having navigators call these potential patients, a majority of these people had primary care physician. Some of them, it's a lack of interest due to stigma. So um, logistics, so being able to take time off work to come, thinking about getting a pre-approval uh, pre um, may be difficult. Nihilism, lung cancer kills everybody. Everybody knows that. So they don't understand the difference with lung cancer screening. They may have social factors that limit. We may have misinformation about lung cancer screening. Lack of awareness. I even have pulmonologists who don't understand the change in the guidelines or share decision-making visits. 
complexity of implementation. So the multidisciplinary collaboration, um, you know, you have to be able to give smoking cessation to, well, what if you don't have access to that? So these are just a few of the things that we recognized at HCA uh, were causing us difficulty. So what we decided is that we'd spent a lot of time building nodule programs. Could we automate a trigger using our EMR and inpatient medical record to identify lung cancer screening? So instead of waiting for patients to be pushed to the pulmonologist, let's pull them to the pulmonologist into a screening and nodule clinic. So what we did was scrub our medical record. We scrubbed our inpatient medical record, those who were 50 and had smoking listed anywhere. So we again hired care coordinators to confirm screening eligibility. And then we coordinated them to a nodule clinic after getting um, you know, permission from the primary care physician. We started with a small group of HCA employed physicians and got permission to review their EMR. So we don't have to call them each time. We then navigated the patients, not to a physician, but to an advanced practice practitioner, um, to an APP, who did a telehealth visit for shared health, for shared decision-making, and then scheduled them for a CT scan. The day that they had their low dose CT scan, they come to clinic. We get an expedited read. If it's an LRAD one or two, the APP continues that visit does any smoking cessation counseling, and then at the time of that visit can schedule them for follow-up surveillance. We know for certain the data says an annual screen at least for three years to receive the mortality benefit. Um, that was obviously the, um, the U.S. Preventative Task Force um, that showed that data. Now, if they're an LRAD three or four, we want them to see a physician. So there's four physicians in our office. Depending on the day, um, if there's an LRAD three or four, then we instantly are on call to see that patient. We want to make this easy. Same process as we did for incidental, risk stratify, if you need a PET scan, if you need to be scheduled for a procedure, we do all of that and our APP helps us coordinate as well. So again, is this going to work? I'm not sure, but I do know that it's very important for us to think outside of the box. If you have different ideas, I really would love to hear Mike and, and, and Jeff's um, input on this. So a couple of questions have come in and, and they relate to some of this panel discussion, which is... You know, and we get asked this question very frequently, uh, is what process do you use to actually get permission from the primary care to navigate, to be involved? Uh, you know, if it's not your patient, is it a HIPAA violation to look at their scan? How does that work specifically? Yeah, so those are great questions. So we did have legal advice for this. So that the thing we're all talking about is a stark violation. So um, directing care for a patient that may already be under the care of another physician. So with our incidental nodule patient, we have to actually get permission to navigate um, from the primary care physician. So we, by law, um, have to make every effort to contact that primary care physician. So we do three calls to the physician office. If we get no call back, we call the patient directly and we say that we've attempted to contact your primary care physician, you know, that there's a, a chance, you know, that they may be upset or may not want this, but we um, have talked with our legal team. We make three attempts to the primary care physician. Then we navigate the patient if the patient is interested. From our screening program, we are doing an education series where we will have blanket for our physician employed, um, HCA physician for the screening process. We won't have to do those calls, but it's very important that you are not directing care. You do not insert yourself into care where that patient may already be um, evaluated and followed up or may already have a cancer diagnosis and being followed by an oncologist. So we have to be very careful. Talk to your legal team, talk to risk management to make sure that all of your, your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, um, that we're not directing care where we shouldn't. Jeffrey, you guys run into any issues like that in your management of patients? Yeah, as I, as I said, you know, right now we're, we're kind of, in the just trying to initiate this and, and kind of working through a lot of the the workflows and so right now we're not currently navigating anyone but just you know starting the process you know maybe a year or two uh, behind where dr garwood is and um and trying to think through how to, how do we best approach this and so you know um right now in our radiology reports we tag the fleischner society guidelines and so we get a lot of referrals from you know, primary care physicians when, you know, the Fleischer criteria are in there regarding, you know, appropriate lung nodule management. So we end up getting a lot of referrals from the primary care physicians, you know, through that mechanism. And then, you know, patient self-referral, you know, knowing that we have a lung nodule program as well. And, and who decides and orders a diagnostic test prior to the clinic visit? Can you do that? 
Um, it, you know, we've been told in our clinic for the last couple of years, I can no longer order a test on a patient until I or someone from my team has seen them. We used to order maybe PFTs or spirometry the day that they come in before they see me. We can't do that anymore. How does that affect you in this situation? We have, you know, those questions come up a lot. And so I think it's really a question of communication. And so when I see a patient, um, I get a packet that looks something like this <laughs> with lots of information and check marks on there. So I get um, the information, I review that. And if they need a PET or a PFT beforehand, um, then there is a discussion about why that process is needed, that I've actually reviewed the chart. It's not something that I'm ordering blindly. So we have not actually had had issues, Michael. So um, I, I know that's often a question that people don't feel comfortable um, or that patient won't understand. And so we actually have our coordinators or our RN. So when they call the patient and say, you're going to see Dr. Garwood, then you know that you have a nodule. Part of that evaluation process is going to include X, Y, or Z. Sometimes they have to stay overnight if they're doing a procedure, but we actually have that communication beforehand. Um, they know that I've reviewed the chart. I think they're trying to, to overcome some of that. Yeah. And then one of the questions that's right here on the panel discussion is identical to a question that's been sent in from the audience, which is how many NPs uh, or navigators do you need, you know, per screen nodules per year? You know, do you have a number or cutoff of, of how many they can see or screen or manage? Um, how do you put some kind of metrics to what you're asking from your hospital? Yeah, so that, I mean, this took us a while to get to our metrics because not everybody's going to need something, right? And so regardless of whether it's a, an LRAD or an incidental, um, our coordinators can do up to 1,200. Some of that's because of our, our um, we have care management software. So we didn't talk about that. So we have um, automated um we have AI program to look for the nodule. Once the nodule's found, they go into a care management software. Uh, we use Eon and that you know populates reminders. And so it, it helps with the efficiency. So it helps with the, the follow-up and moving the patient through the system. And so um, you need those things if you're going to manage them. And really just talking about coordinating care, this is kind of our kumbaya moment that we close with, reminding everybody how important we are as pulmonologists and gatekeepers to the system, but how it's really a multidisciplinary thing in that we all have to work together. So this is a very accurate slide. And in order to make sure that this happens, you really need a multidisciplinary structure uh, to be developed at your institution. And everybody has to work together. Everybody has to check their egos at the doors um, and work together and remember to put the patient first. Um, and at a minimum, you really need uh, to have structured reporting. Uh, which uh, Dr. Garwood has talked about, nodule management algorithms, uh, and you guys will figure out in your own program where those cutoffs start. Dr. Garwood moved it from eight millimeters down to six millimeters, probably uh, because now we have technology like robotics and things like that and cone beam CT where we can go after six millimeter nodules. Um, before, we didn't really have a way to reliably do that so why should we flag six millimeter nodules? And the other point was something that she mentioned earlier is that you know flagging them early um, allows you to not miss something uh, that may be growing. And so catching them smaller and earlier is, is the best thing to do. You have to have the structure and the maintenance and the integrity of your lung cancer screening registry whether that's the program at your hospital, whoever is managing that, uh, you need to be keeping track of these with a software program. You really want to have um, oversight over the research that's conducted on the registry. And that registry information really needs to be shared with everyone in this circle. But if that information is not shared with everybody around that circle, um, then you don't really know the information that you're collecting. You don't know how well you're doing or maybe how poorly you're doing. Um, and you also want to look out uh, for the research that would help to define the criteria for screening eligibility. And it's not just one thing. This is really a multi-pronged effort to stimulate your lung cancer screening program. It has to be direct to patient. You have to target your PCPs. You have to talk to your pulmonologist. So hit everybody that you can, including the patients, because they can self-refer themselves uh, to these programs. So you remember this, we were basically saying, hey, don't forget about pulmonology and the important role that we play, because for a lot of systems, we are the gatekeepers. We're at the very beginning. And, and just like Susan, um, every referral that comes into our multidisciplinary chest center, I review personally those scans with my nurse navigator. So every time a referral comes in, she sends me a secure chat message and I look at the scans and I say, okay, 
this is how quickly we need to get this patient in. We're typically seeing patients within a week, but there are some that we don't even want them to wait that long. Um, so this is just a part of the whole continuum, and we want to make sure that that's seamless for the patient. So uh, the key takeaways here, again, that the pulmonologist in your system uh, can play a key role, and it doesn't have to be just the pulmonologist. Keep in mind that this is just a physician champion. Um, there are some places where pulmonology is more so in the clinic and reading sleep studies and doing COPD, and they're not necessarily the ones doing interventions and biopsies, maybe not even the ones doing robotic bronchoscopies. Maybe it's a thoracic surgeon. You just have to have that physician champion um, because they play a key role in that, in that patient's journey. Uh, you want to have the automated follow-up of the incidental pulmonary nodules. If you're not tracking incidental pulmonary nodules, you're missing the bulk of, of where where the cancers are and where the nodules are. Uh, you know, the number of screen detected nodules, as you heard um, uh, Jeff talk about at the very beginning, pales in comparison overall to the number of incidental nodules that are detected. And we have to have navigators to ensure that our patients with nodules are evaluated and seen if they're eligible. And as Susan pointed out, that needs to be a clinical person. They have to have, uh, you know, some knowledge uh, of lung cancer and screening and nodules and procedures and molecular testing and all those things. Having an automated referral for lung cancer screening with software to detect eligible patients is possible. And you really need to have those coordinators that can help ensure appropriate patients are getting lung cancer screening. And we also have to coordinate with other members of the multidisciplinary team to really develop a system for managing both incidentals and screen detected nodules. There was one question that I wanted to get to earlier on is, um, are you doing anything specifically to target areas that are in the minority, whether it's socioeconomic um, or ethnicity in your areas? I've heard some places are having a, a lung bus, you know, that goes around to other areas. Are there any specific programs that you guys are aware of at your institutions uh, where you're trying to get to the underserved? Yeah, we try and, you know, do, you know, outreach programs. Um, you know, I, I gave a talk at a a local church in our you know community you know not not too long ago just about lung lung nodule management lung cancer screening so just various you know outreach programs to try and you know provide you know educational resources to kind of bring bring more patients in from the community for you know lung cancer screening and and lung nodule management just to be you know more aware of kind of what what's available and what resources are out there <music>